Well, welcome. Um, my name is Matt Turry. I'm the Manuscript Research Librarian in Wilson Library, and this is the inaugural um, session of the sort of online research forum. It was um, really nice. We've been chatting for about the last half hour, and it sort of reminded me how much I miss sort of casual conversations with researchers about what they're doing, um, which is really the goal of this conversation today. It's, it's meant to be sort of casual, and it's meant um, sort of pragmatically from the librarian's point of view to get a little bit into the head of the researchers that really engage with the materials much more intensively than we ever could. And they certainly asked very, very different questions than we do. Um, in terms of structure today, we're basically gonna have um, Scott Hufford talk first for 20 minutes and then Noah Angel talk for another 20 minutes, um, leaving time at the end, roughly about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, um, you all have access to the chat box and we would really um, ask you to, to put in the questions that arise um, in your mind so that we can ask them and I'll simply read them at the end of this, towards the end of the session. Um, I'd like to sort of thank a few people. First and foremost, Nadia and um, our, our colleagues in uh, library communications who actually made this possible. Um, I'm not capable of using Zoom in this sort of sophisticated manner. So it was a great relief to have her here. And also, um, I have the great pleasure of helping organize the fellowship program here, but it's one of those um, sort of efforts that spans the libraries. Um, and it takes a lot of people to make this happen. And um, I'm not gonna name everybody obviously, but I'm very grateful for the help and the support that they provide to make um, our fellowship program possible. In terms of introductions today, um, Scott Hufford is going to do a presentation called Looking for Casey Jones in the Southern Folklife Collection. Um, Scott was a recipient of a uh, visiting research fellowship. And in this instance, um, those are supported by a number of different funds, often depend mostly depending upon the subject matter that the researcher is engaging in. And in this instance, um, this was supported by the John and Eugene, John Eugene and Barbara Hilton K Fund, which supports the study of the literary culture and traditions of the American South. Um, Scott lives in Beach Mountain and they apparently got 44 inches of snow this winter, which is impressive. Um, he's an associate professor of history at Lee McRae College. His first book, Engines of Redemption, Railroads, and the Reconstruction of Capitalism in the New South, was published with UNC Press in 2019. And he's currently researching and writing a second book project on the life and legend of the engineer and folk hero Casey Jones. Our second speaker today is Noah Angel. Um, he was the recipient of an audiovisual research fellowship that was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation as a part of a larger grant that was um, supporting the Southern Folklife Collection in its efforts to digitize, preserve, and make accessible audiovisual materials. Um, his presentation title is If I Were If I Was a Lizard in the Spring, Singing a Renunciation in Southern Appalachia. Um, Noah um, is an artist, he's a writer, a researcher, a storyteller, and a filmmaker. And his work focuses on orally transmitted forms, including song and storytelling. That's what I have to say for right now in the beginning. And I think we're going to turn things over to Scott. Sure thing. Let me just get the screen share. Uh, uh, thank you. And thank you, folks, for, for coming and for the interest in the, the project. I had a great two weeks in the archives over the summer. And I'm happy to share some, some findings. I was just telling the folks before, this almost felt like drinking from a fire hose, uh, my two weeks in the archive. So uh, it might be hard to have some kind of grand conclusion or thesis, but I did wanna at least share sort of what I found and talk about how the time in the archives helped shape this, this project on Casey Jones that I'm working on here. So um, to our modern sensibilities, uh, we think about Casey Jones, usually in the context of the, the Grateful Dead, uh, you know, the song Casey Jones appears on their 1970 classic album, Working Man's Dead. Uh, the final song, it tells the story of Casey Jones, who's driving that train high on cocaine, has to watch his speed. Uh, and this is, you know, when I mentioned this project, everyone always asks about the, the Grateful Dead. I guess I must know a lot of uh, deadheads. Uh, you know, this is not, of course, the first time Casey Jones was in the ears of every American. You know, in 1909, uh, 1910, we have the release of a vaudeville hit that, that goes 
pretty much, I guess, to use the modern term viral across the country, uh, written by Lawrence Siebert and Eddie Newton. The uh, New York Times called this the most popular song of the 1910s, even uh, in one sort of decade by decade survey. So uh, thanks to these songs, Casey Jones is probably the, the best engineer in America. You know, he, I would say, is probably in what we would call maybe the pantheon of American folk heroes. I guess if you want to give Disney credit for creating this pantheon or, or establishing it, you know, you could look at the Disney American Legends uh, video, which compiled a series of these sort of uh, folk stories with Paul Bunyan, John Henry, Johnny Appleseed, um, all, all, all sort of together here. Um, you know, he's so ubiquitous that he almost seems to be an invented figure, you know, removed from the realities of railroading. Uh, but we know there was a real Casey Jones, you know, and here's just uh, two newspaper pieces that sort of speak to his real story. There was a guy, um, John Luther Jones, whose nickname was, was Casey, who is killed in Illinois Central Wreck. And uh, he was basically running fast, trying to make up lost time in the middle of Mississippi. Uh, he slams into a freight train that's backed up on the line. Uh, and he you know, essentially goes down with the metaphorical ship. And that's why we have sort of these heroic engineer stories that come even you know, the, the day after the guy is killed basically. Uh, so this is the part of the story that, that I knew pretty well going into the archives. I mean, my, my first book, uh, as as Matt mentioned, it was on railroads, 19th century South, basically this time frame in which Casey lived. And I came into this thing. I'm just going to write a biography of, of Casey Jones uh, and and focus on his life. Uh, but it, you know, looking more into this, I just talked better about this whole idea too. That the what happens to him after his death is honestly a lot more interesting. I think you know his life is is, is interesting. It's sort of he's a worker. He 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 dies on the job. That that's bleak, obviously, and a story to tell. Uh, but but he takes on this entirely new life after his death, and it all sort of goes in with the, these ballads that are telling his story. You know the kind of apocryphal tale of sort of where the the ballad came from uh, comes from John Lomax who visited Canton, Mississippi, you know, the shops where the train was supposed to go. He interviews folks on the ground and they come up with this kind of origin story that an illiterate African-American engine wiper named Wallace Saunders, who worked in IC shops, only central shops, uh, wrote the ballad basically to, to mourn the death of, of this local legend, an engineer that he knew quite well. A traveling performer then, as the story goes, picks up these verses, hears them, uh, these two vaudeville songs, this kind of polish it up, Newton and Siebert, and then the song becomes this nationwide hit. And this is essentially what Lomax confirms. This is sort of the, the standard story here. Uh, so my research sort of starts with a, a simple question. How do we untangle the man in the myth? You know, there are thousands of railroad workers that die in accidents on the job in this era. It's especially in the South, the most dangerous railroads in, in the country. Uh, so why is Casey the one that sticks? Why is he popping up in American pop culture? Uh, why have so many Americans been looking for Casey Jones or the true Casey Jones or the real Casey Jones? Uh, so those are the questions that kind of animated my time in, in the archives. Um, again, my, my training is, is in, in history and I spent time maybe I think 10 years ago to maybe show my age now, I guess, in, in Wilson Library doing research for my first book. And that was very much focused on traditional, you know, history sources, you know, uh, letters and, and manuscripts and archival collections from, from companies, things like that. Uh, you know, it was a different approach this time, uh, looking mainly at stuff in the Southern Folklife collection. You know, so in particular, I was focusing on stuff from DK Wilgus, Archie Green, and, and Norm Cohen, who are all three, you know, folklorists from working mainly in the 20th century, 50s, 60s is where a lot of the, the production is, 70s even. Uh, they all spent significant time collecting Casey Jones ballads uh, and also sort of the, the real story, news articles about uh, the man as well. Um, I also did look, and I'll show some images later of the song folios, uh, some AV sources, and of course the, the rare books. Uh, just being in a big library was was nice because I'm a small school with, with a small library and, and having access to UNC's collections was excellent, obviously. So uh, the DK Wilgus collection, uh, again, this is a super well-organized collection. 
I uh, found it really easy to work with. Uh, you know, part of this thing is probably down to Wilgus himself, who kept this really meticulous card catalog. And he classified all these different ballads based on Malcolm Laws's scheme, which, you know, Casey Jones is, is G1 here. And there were hundreds of cards. Each card had a different recording that you could, uh, in theory, track down later. And I scanned all these just to sort of make sure I, I had them. Um, so, so it was, you know, very easy to work with a lot of the stuff. There also were folders that just said Casey Jones that had, you know, this much material in it. So again, it really was drinking from a fire hose in terms of just the amount of, of content I got. And, you know, I knew the lyrics, of course, to the main vaudeville version and, and the Grateful Dead song. But, you know, it really quickly was apparent that what was interesting was not so much this vaudeville hit, which, you know, comes out and here's an example of a standard version that uh, he collected in Kentucky or someone collected in Kentucky shows up in the collection. You know, this, this, this appears again and again, these sort of same lyrics, same stanzas. That's not the most interesting part. What's interesting really, I think, are these different variations and iterations of the ballad. You know, there's almost this, you know, it's an apocryphal story of how this song gets passed down. And, uh, it's more complicated than that. And I quickly realized that, you know, for, and again, the folklorists were sort of on top of this, this too. Uh, Wilgus had this folder, Jay Gould's Daughter slash Casey Jones, which, oh, that's interesting. Those are two different songs. Those are, you know, again, variants. And, you know, this one example here is about a guy na named Charlie Snyder. Uh, and some of this stuff was collected by people like Howard Odom, you know, there are these, all these sort of interesting variants that are about engineers doing something really similar. There's uh, lines like, see the driver's roll, which end up in the Casey Jones ballad. Uh, you know, we have new characters getting involved. You know, who is this Charlie Snyder fellow? Uh, you have Jay Gould's daughter, who, you know, Jay Gould is famous, you know, um, rail baron here. Uh, so this really seems more like the, the interesting story here. And, Apologies for cat intrusion here, but uh, you know that we have all these sort of different variants and complications to this story. You know, just to sort of recap, we kind of know we have these big moments where you know, working men's dead. We, I'll talk about Joe Hill's parody in a second. The vaudeville hit. You know, Canton. We have Lomax going to Canton, but these ambiguities. That's what really caught my attention in the archives. The fact that we have this wide range of Casey Jones ballads that, uh, you know, who even is the, the real author? You know, that, that's the question that, uh, you know, Norm Cohen, whose stuff I looked at too, he kind of circles on that question and says, hey, maybe this Wallace Saunders story is actually not really how this happened. Maybe this was more collective, you know, endeavor, the writing of this ballad it came from a whole bunch of different people. And, uh, you know, the, the real key moment is the time between this wreck and the vaudeville hit, because the, the vaudeville hit comes out in 1909, and, and this kind of replaces everything else. This becomes this national, you know, smash hit, and in some ways kind of subsumes all the other precursors out there. So, you know, the real interesting thing that a lot of these folks were looking for, and I'm looking for too, are these ballads before 1909, which helped get this question of who actually wrote this song uh, did you ever write the song? Were they inspired by their options? Are there variants here? What their precursor ballads? You know, the Jay Gould's daughter kind of idea. And, and, you know, there's these ambiguities too about who even is the real Casey Jones. You know, there was this national search for who is Casey Jones after the song comes out. And, and there were, you know, 10, 12 other people that claimed, hey, I'm actually Casey Jones or I know Casey Jones and he died in Montana. Or, you know, Casey Jones, so yeah, he, he was killed in a wreck in Maryland. Uh, so I'm going to be running sort of those leads down and see if I can figure out what these wrecks were and, and where that is. And again, these other engineers, too, are, are interesting. Who is Joseph Micah? Who's Charlie Snyder? Are these real engineers? Now, I'm still working on, on that, obviously. Uh, so that's sort of where my, my search sort of moved to. Not so much, yeah, we know the standard story, but what, what complicates the story and what are some of the variants you can, can look at? So uh, one example of one of these ballads that I found that again is sort of interesting is from 1903. 
which I found this using newspaper databases, which the folklorists, uh, they couldn't type searching into newspaper databases. We have sort of unfair advantage in the 21st century. And this is Paducah, Kentucky, 1903. And this in some ways already complicates what the folklorists had thought they knew about this because we have uh, a form of the ballad that comes up here in, in 1903. And then some of these lines and you know make it into the final version. There's a whole longer version. I didn't put the whole thing. In, in the slide. Uh, so that's, you know, again, what I've been looking for, these kind of complicating ballads. And there's plenty of examples in the archives too. You know, for example, again, DK Wilgus, the, the folklore archives are great to work with because it's super organized. Uh, it's typed, a lot of the stuff I like, you know, type sources are always nicer than handwritten ones. Uh, so you can get through stuff pretty pretty fast. Here again is, uh, you know, an informant gives, gives DK Wilgus this, this example of, of the six wheeler, which is about uh, this Jimmy Jones character and Joseph Michael, who is also a Joseph Micah kind of adjacent name here. Um, so yeah, I was sort of sifting through all that stuff in the archives. Uh, you know, here's another example of the, the Joseph Micah song, who uh, is a good engineer, told his family not to fear. Again, that's a very same line as, as Casey Jones, and some of these songs predate Casey Jones. So um, again, I'm still working out my conclusions on, on this, obviously, but you know, I have these, these great sources to work with now, uh, largely thanks to this time in the collection here. I uh, use another fragment. This puts him in Corbin, Kentucky. You know, we have yeah, in 1905, even we have Casey Jones showing up in Kentucky, entirely different rail line here, basically. So uh, yeah, and again, some of the stuff, again, is obviously published in other sources, but the way that it's just collected in the folklore collections or folklore collections makes it so easy to work with all this, this stuff. So uh, it was easy to find a lot of material. Uh, you know, stuff popped up in interesting directions. This one song was collected on Beach Mountain from Boona Hicks. This is part of the Hicks family, uh, famous storytellers, basically Boona Hicks. Um, and that's interesting too. Why are folks, you know, looking for Casey Jones in Beach Mountain, you know, the, the, it's pretty far from Mississippi, but, you know, he's popping up in all these kind of interesting places in the archives that, that we see here. Uh, you know, the, the DK Wilgus has eight tapes worth of Casey Jones material. And again, I'm still sifting through all this. It's a lot to, to listen to, uh, but it was great. The library was able to digitize these, make them all accessible to me. I have them as as, as digital files listen to. Uh, the field notes are interesting here too. This is basically telling you, of course, what the tracks are and the recordings. And then he his notations are interesting too. N and S, this is him noting that it's a Newton and Siebert variation. It's not, you know, anything, it's just the standard vaudeville. And, you know, the question marks why, you know, it's interesting. And uh, this is tape five. This one, yeah, Yeech, he didn't like the Burl Ives cover, I guess. So he, um, at his little commentaries. The field notes are very useful, full too, basically in the Wilgus collection. Uh, you know, I also spent some time in the Archie Green collection, which uh, is very labor focused. And here in particular, I was looking at the IWW parody of Casey Jones, which shows up in Little Red Songbook, which has been published, you know, many iterations. And Archie Green worked on the Big Red Songbook, and he wrote about it in that too, basically. You know, this version puts Casey Jones as a scab who undermines worker solidarity and you know, undermines a strike. And in the end, he's he's killed uh, you know, by the strikers. They wreck his train and he goes to hell, basically. So uh, you know, a subversive kind of version that I also have been able to trace. It moves around the country in interesting ways. This this subversive parody, which is in some ways spreading parallel to the sort of main vaudeville one. Uh, you know, there's super helpful bibliographies in the Archie Green collection. You know, they, folklorists kept all these records of every time Casey Jones is cited. And I was able to track down these either in the research notes in the collections or on my own. So again, that's super helpful having all this stuff. Uh, you know, Casey Jones popped up in some pretty interesting ways in the Archie Green collection. He has lots of rare books. So yeah, here's uh, some Finnish labor songs. I had to get out my phone and use the Google Translate thing to try to translate this and uh, might have to consult someone who actually knows Finnish on this. I think it's the similar lyrics to the, the Union Scab, but it shows up in this book, published in Minnesota entirely in Finnish of Finnish labor songs. Uh, you know, in German too, this is, 
uh, Horst Roos, uh, another so German labor songs. And this is, a, I know some German, this is a direct translation of the, of the, the Joe Hill one in German. Uh, you know, Textile Workers of America, similar kind of uh, presentation, labor songs. And here's Casey Jones, uh, again, popping up in a labor context. Uh, you know, Casey Jones shows up at LMA Wiggins' funeral even. You know, the labor song moves in interesting ways. Uh, you know, LMA Wiggins was part of this big textile strike in Gastonia in the 1920s, and she's killed by the strike breakers. And, you know, they have this really dramatic funeral and, you know, the high point, a girl sings Casey Jones, you know, which uh, was taught to many of the strikers uh, by IDW organizers who were spreading this, this song, basically. So that's a story I'm, I'm chasing down as well. Uh, I also looked at the Norm Cohen file collection, which I was very grateful to the library to let me into some of the stuff, which is kind of unprocessed. But uh, Norm Cohen wrote kind of the definitive book on railroads folk songs, and the definitive article on Casey Jones, which again, kind of questions the standard narrative. So I was pouring over lots of his research files as well, and looking at, you know, here's a letter between him and an informant. You know, in the 1960s, he published in Good Old Days magazine, which is aimed at, at older folks, and asked if anyone knew any Casey Jones ballads and got all this interesting correspondence. People were writing letters saying, oh yeah, I know Casey Jones. Or, uh, I mean, it wasn't super productive for him because it was the 1960s, a long time since uh, when the ballad comes out. But there's some interesting threads of correspondence between him and these random people that were reading this magazine and decide to talk to him about songs. This woman was collecting a series of songs. Uh, you know, his research notes were, were there, you know, so. There was this big search for Casey Jones, 1910s in, in Railroad Man's magazine. So I was able to scan stuff like this. And this is someone testifying basically that, oh yeah, I know the real Casey Jones and he was here uh, and he was killed in Mammoth Springs, this person says. So there's, again, all this interesting variation of who actually this guy is and where he, he died basically. Uh, you know, these were folklorists writing each other too, of course, which is interesting. You know, Norm Cohen and Archie Green and what was write letters to each other and this correspondence shows up as well. And they're all looking for sort of similar things. So in a sense, this kind of quest for Casey Jones, that's going to be a, a plot of the book as well, following these folklorists as they, they trace and look for Casey Jones. Uh, you know, I end up sort of really focusing on Robert Winslow Gordon as someone, a uh, pretty main character. This guy starts the Archive of American Folk Song in the 1920s. He had this column, old songs that men have sung, and he was inquiring on Casey Jones in the 1920s, basically trying to find folks with you know precursor ballads, and he found some some pretty good stuff. Uh, and again, Cohen had scans from Gordon's archives. I was able to look at these letters to Gordon that were basically request when they responded to his request for information, and and you know there's interesting stories, and, and there's a version that involves a cow. Uh, you know, this guy claims, oh yeah, I know it's Bill Jones's brother, which it's, it's, he didn't have a brother named Bill Jones, I don't think. So, um, so again, yeah, all this stuff is 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 interesting, helpful. The final thing, and I know I'm hitting sort of the time limit here, so I'll kind of do this sort of quickly. I looked at song folios too; these are interesting, just sort of how Casey Jones is being presented, and um, yeah, he's part of the canon in so many different ways homespun songs this one yeah cowboy songs i guess we have casey jones from this guy cowboy slim reinhardt uh you know that was interesting rambling red lowry you know so casey jones is popping up in all these different contexts which is going to be a, a interesting theme to, to follow and then you know i also did dive into av files you know tapes things like that interview with Fireman Sim Webb, which is very interesting. And again, the staff were able to help me uh, digitize those and, and have them to look at later. Uh, so some takeaways you know, to, to wrap things up, you know, the I'm definitely shifting this project more towards his journey through pop culture than his life itself. That's more interesting, I think. And the many variants of the song speak to that. The fact that we have these very murky origins, it's not as clear cut as I think. A lot of Americans want it to be this origin story. Uh, you know, there's a really dramatic impact too. these parodies. I mean, 
uh, the Klan parried the song at one point. Uh, there's a sexually explicit parody at one point. I mean, it's all over the place how this is used in all kinds of different ways. And I found a lot of examples of that. He's almost this kind of blank slate who changes meanings. And that makes, I think, for what should be an interesting book project, sort of following this as it moves through American culture. And then the final thing I'm thinking about is who is looking for Casey Jones and why? You know, what I decide is that the folklorists can become characters in this story too. You know, follow them as they look for Casey Jones and, and, and how they're doing this and look for the real Casey Jones. So again, I don't have conclusions yet. I'm not sure if I'll find the, the ballad that, that breaks the story open, but I have a lot to work with. And the time in the library really helped me to shape this book in a, a better direction, I think, for sure. And so, so thanks to the library again, and thanks to everyone for, for listening to this somewhat quick, I know, spiel through all my, my research notes here. Great. Well, thank you so much, Scott. And we're going to come back around for some questions towards the end. I already see a couple in the chat that will be interesting. Um, now we're going to go on to, to Noah. And just as a reminder, um, Noah is going to be talking to us today about his research and the, the presentation title that he, he shared with us is If I Was a Lizard in the Spring, Singing a Renunciation of Southern Appalachia. Um, Noah, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's actually not to be pedantic, but it's it's in Southern Appalachia. They're not renouncing Southern Appalachia as such. Uh, um, yeah, I don't have a PowerPoint set up. I don't even know how to do a PowerPoint. So I'm just going to go through uh, some of the research materials that I found and talk you through them. I've been working on this for a few years and my head is kind of swimming with all sorts of materials. So 20 minutes is a real challenge. And I think improvising and keeping it fluid is probably the best approach. So uh, first of all, I want to say uh, it was an honor to be at the Wilson Library. Uh, I was born, I was, I was a baby in Carborough anyway, and I have lots of memories from childhood onwards. And it was nice to spend some time in the archives. Um, now, the topic of my research is something many of you are probably familiar with, but I won't assume everyone is. There's a song, a traditional collectively authored song, uh, which is known to most by the name Mole in the Ground. Uh, in Surrey County around Round Peak, they call it Tempe. Uh, Omi, let your bangs hang down. Sammy, where you've been so long. It starts to become, there's a similar tune called Last Gold Dollar that becomes kind of the same tune as you go into Kentucky or even parts of Southwest Virginia. And part of what I'm doing is uh, tracking these versions because the uh, first recorded version, uh, the ba Bascom Lamar Lunsford, who's, you know, from around Asheville, uh, popularized it. He was the first person to record it for Brunswick in 1927, I believe, but he learned it from Fred Moody who he always credited. And Fred Moody was recorded, uh, I think by the Lomaxes in 1921. I don't know if it's a wax cylinder or an acetate. It just sounds like a bunch of noise uh, with you know small intimations of the tune that Lunsford later performed. Anyway, I'm charting the growth, the evolution of this tune as it traveled from county to county, looking at examples of people who learned this song orally, not from records. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen so I can start to walk you through all of that. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes? Oh, no, not yet. Yeah? So, Anyway, for, for example, this is a little bit of private access here. This is my Tempe playlist on my uh, iPod. So this is essentially what I had before I did the, uh, the thing at the Folklife Collection. I mean, at the, um, at the Wilson Library. Um, and sorry, I'm rambling a bit. There's a lot to get to here, but uh, the song uh, is generally, it's often been called a bit of a nonsense song or sometimes characterized as surrealist. Uh, you can see, this is from the uh, Frank Warner North Carolina Folklore Collection. 
uh, transcribes the Moody version from 1921. And uh, you can see from the, the first few verses that essentially, in most cases, it starts off as a courtship song, let's say, like he's asking this woman to let her hair down, asking her where she was last night. Uh, she wants a $9 shawl. He comes with a $40 bill and she's asking, where have you been so long? Uh, clearly she has material needs that the, the interlocutor is not able to uh, satisfy. The $40 bill, I thought perhaps this was a counterfeit thing. This is something that might actually date the song back to the colonial period when there was a $40 bill, so I've read. Um, anyway, it's often been sort of characterized as a nonsense song or surrealist. And my idea is that if you look at all of the verses from the different iterations of the song, then this is, in my opinion, someone who is not a landowner. There are, in some cases, uh, speculation that this is uh, of African American origin. Um, otherwise, it would it would be a poor white who is essentially, uh, you know, didn't have much of a place in the plantation system at the time. So my idea is sorry to be long winded, but um, it starts off as a courtship song. Starts asking where she's been last night. She's working. Uh, she was in the bend with the rough and rowdy men. She wants this money for a shawl. All of a sudden he's realizing that he can't support this woman. Uh, debt, he's saying, you know, there's verses such as uh, Tempe, what am I gonna do? My whiskey bill is due and my land bill too. Uh, and I think basically when he starts, when the hook comes and it's, I wish I was a mole in the ground. If I was a mole in the ground, I'd root this mountain down or I wish I was a lizard in the spring. If I was a lizard in the spring, I could hear my darling sing. My idea is that this is a sort of renunciation of manhood as it was tied to land ownership and white supremacy in the plantation system at the time. And as such, I was looking for different verses from the different counties that would maybe inform this picture. Uh, as the song moves around, you can see in this uh, Frank Warner, um, North Carolina folklore collection, it says the song is a medley, possibly from the minstrel stage, originating among roustabouts themselves. I found this uh, Mary Wheeler Steamboat and Days uh, song that is referred to. Um, and yes, there's, there's uh, the verses aren't exactly the same, but uh, let your hair hang down and so on, there are sort of remnants of what the later tune appears as. Uh, if this is the origin, which I certainly wouldn't doubt it, then I think it would have gone through a middle period of, of uh, being transformed on the menstrual stage and then maybe, uh, you know, taking on a more local life in Western North Carolina and then spreading up to Southwest Virginia and Eastern Tennessee and so on and so forth. So um, one of the things that I found Early on, that was interesting. There's the song Rattler. It's a pretty well-known song. Uh, Elizabeth Cotton, it was in her repertoire. She played the, she played the banjo uh, using the song Rattler. It's about a dog. Uh, and one thing that caught my eye early on is that there's this verse, because in, in Mole in the Ground, one of the things that you have is, you know, uh, if I was a mole in the ground, I'd root this mountain down. And you think, well, these are mountain dwelling people. So they're really talking about the foundations of the world that they live in coming down. Uh, and there is a verse in one of these, this was in the Gus Mead collection. He's kind of a, a fantastic historian of country music, you know, quote unquote. But there's a verse in this old version of Rattler that I'd never heard before. Climb those Blue Ridge Mountains, they're 47 miles around. I think I'll buy me a sage axe and cut these mountains down. So this is a precedent in terms of uh, mountain people wishing to uh, remove the foundations, the mountains at their foundations, uh, which was interesting. Um, another version. And then what I was doing to uh, another, another rattler that includes the same verse. Then what I was doing is, as you could see from the, uh, from the playlist that I started with, 
there's some pretty big figures in the world of North Carolina music. Gaither Carlton was Doc Watson's father-in-law, taught him a bunch of tunes. Bascom Lamar Lunsford is like a one-man library of uh, not only North Carolina, but surrounding areas. Ola Bell Reed, Doc Boggs, uh, some more obscure people, Tommy Gerald and Fred Cockrum. So one thing I was looking for was uh, not only new versions of the song, which was my primary interest because I was trying to turn up new verses uh, that might inform the broader picture of this song as it traveled and maybe how people who performed it understood it. But I was looking for interview material that would maybe catch ref the performers reflecting on their understanding of the song, who taught it to them, which verses they include, which verses they don't, so that this could be uh, made clear as the song's uh, evolution is mapped from county to county. Tommy Gerald's a big one. Uh, they played this song a lot. There was some joke where him and Fred Cockrum are talking about how they played the song an entire night at a wedding. And as a joke, uh, I don't quite get the joke, but they thought it was funny. Uh, Lunsford is really the one who made the song very popular because his version was... Uh, was included on Harry Smith's uh, American folk music anthology. Uh, so Lunsford is most closely identified with this and uh, fantastic resource for any of you who have access to it. Uh, UNC holds his Columbia sessions. Twice in Lunsford's life, he emptied out his memory completely, once at Columbia University and once at Library of Congress in DC. In each case, he stayed for about two weeks, recorded 500 songs, all the poems, tales, everything he could remember, really. Uh, and, and you can, if you have access, like I was lucky to this time, now I have, you know, what's commercially available is maybe an hour or an hour and a half of Lunsford music. And I've got at least, I don't know, 16 hours now that I can pour over. Um, going through the artist Moser collection, he was a historian and folklorist in Western North Carolina who documented Lunsford very closely. All sorts of personal correspondence between these two, which is pretty cool. Uh, for instance, you know, I found the Library of Congress letter to Moser thanking him for what we basically now know as the first recorded discs of, uh, of Lunsford. I think that was. Well, no, that's not true. It says 47. So the Brunswick things were much earlier. But anyway, that's an important link. The vast majority of my time. Um, see, these are these are uh, these are some of the transcriptions from the uh, the song listing from the Columbia recordings, which are incredible. 1935. Um, the vast majority of my time, okay, I was researching the different players. I was researching uh, any kind of narratives I could find about their lives that might sort of inform their understanding of these songs. Um, but I was really going through tons and tons of field notes so that I could find new versions of this song uh, or variations that I didn't know existed. Um, yeah, there's Lunsford again with Frank C. Brown. I mean, this stuff is boring, but it's really like the core of it all. That's the Fred Moody version. Uh, here you have Gaither Carlton. As I said, he was uh, Doc Watson's father-in-law. This is from the um, Tom Carter collection. It's really important. I mean, a lot of these folks, Tom Carter, Blanton Owen, Alice Gerard, Mike Seeger, I mean, these were kind of heavy hitters in terms of covering a lot of these musicians. This was interesting. I believe it was this. Uh, there's a lot of people going to see Gaither Carlton before he died and doing home recordings. There's his version of Omi oh Let Your Bangs Hang Down. And he has this funny story about this came out on County Records, More Claw Hammer Banjo Volume 2, I believe. And uh, he talks about how this guy from the Netherlands, from Holland, came after hearing this record and his whole thing was that he just wanted to like sit around and listen to Gaither Carlton play the banjo for a week. <laughs> and Carlton was amused by this. He thought, well, he didn't pick anything. He didn't play anything. I don't know what, but he just basically heard him play this one, one song and booked a trip to uh, Deep Gap. 
or whatever and just insisted upon hearing him play 24 hours a day for for a week or so and and carlton was tickled by this uh so you know a lot more of this this is cockrum fred cockrum and tommy gerald tippy roll down your bangs is how it's annotated there abe horton southwest virginia played a lot with uh, harold hausenfluck and also the pine what they call it, the Pine Valley Boys and Maybell or something like that. Uh, instrumental version, no new, new verses, but you know, something I hadn't heard before. Uh, very nice recordings of Fred Cockrum, you know, early in his recording history when he's about 70 years old, about 10 years before he died. Robert Sykes, who's a fiddle player uh, around Mount Airy. Nice version, uh, Frank Bodie doing the vocals on that. Seems like our live radio broadcast. Uh, this is from the Seeger collection. There's a JC Sutphin does Mole in the Ground here, who's recorded on, uh, there's a record called Closer to Home, which was some of Seeger's later recordings. Uh, I should say that out of all, I was looking for new versions of the song primarily. And uh, I found a lot of variations by people who I had already heard versions from again tommy gerald fred cockrum uh, basketball lamar lunsford um you know all these folks i found seven versions which were entirely new to me which was not bad i mean most of those performers were unknown some of them are fairly known none of these are commercially released or otherwise available and uh there are some new verses there which is what i was looking for so yeah, I'm just showing you the boring field notes because this is what I was doing uh, for all for most of that time. Uh, Pearlie Davis and family is one with Doc Walsh. Uh, this I would have to say this next one is one of the George Landers, who some of y'all may know, appeared on this uh, high atmosphere record that John Cohen recorded. Very interesting idiosyncratic banjo player from Southwest Virginia. He has a version of both Tempe and Last Gold, and Last Gold Dollar, which are uh, in, in many cases sort of variants on one another. Uh, I'm gonna speed through this because we're running out of time. Alice Gerard with uh, Tommy Gerald. Here we have the notes from Doc Boggs for studio session. He didn't really play it much in his later dates, but we have uh, yeah, some of these documents, the verses on the Doc Boggs version. I went through folklore that was about the relationship to the natural world, Lewis's story of how he was charmed by a rattlesnake, uh, how a half dozen hogs licked 50, 500 rattlesnakes. Uh, this was mostly from the Moser collection. There's a magic lake somewhere in the Smokies, just all sorts of things about within this uh, paradigm of land ownership, the relationship, the sort of strange relationship to the natural world. One thing I wanted to share, because it's quite funny, this was in the Seeger collection. It's a tape of Frank Prophet on a radio broadcast, I suppose. Uh, and there's a note back to this motif of, of rooting the mountain down. This guy, uh, Howard Mitchell, writes a note to Mike Seeger. Says, I've forgotten much of what is on the tape, but there's one hilarious segment in which Frank goes through the original jacket notes for one of his Folkways recordings which contains some 30 or so typos due to the editors not understanding Frank's local traditional Elizabethan pronunciation of English. He also waxes profound as he conjectures on the desirable benefit to Boone of his planned groundhog steakhouse. He hopes to help reduce the animal's menace to the mountains, which are slowly sinking down because of the ceaseless activities of these pesky burrowing rodents. So there's Frank Prophet with his million dollar idea to keep the groundhogs from rooting the mountain down. Uh, and I'll finish with this. There's an interview with artist Moser where he's talking about his people, basically, who uh, were Germans who came in from Philadelphia and, uh, you know, sort of kept going southwest. And basically what he says is that uh, they settled in the Appalachian Mountains because this reminded them of the Black Forest area of Germany where they'd come from. And uh, one of my possible ideas for assembling all this material is I'd like to make a long piece, which would be uh, sort of like a lecture performance work, but maybe more of a, just a radio sort of audio work. 
which would present many of these songs and tie them together and discuss the varying verses and such. But I'm, I have a friend who I believe is watching now named Olson Wolf, who runs a space in Black Forest. And I would like to assemble all this research in Black Forest from the perspective of these folks who uh, were, uh, were eventually settlers and, you know, in some cases, landowners and such in Western North Carolina. Uh, but started out from the Black Forest area of Germany and this kind of uh, idea of the natural world as it evolved as they went you know, to the quote unquote new world, et cetera. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now because that's been about 20 minutes. But uh, thank you for listening. I hope that was not too uh, boring or dense. <laughs> Thank you so much, Noah. Well, one of the things um, that's always important is that these research forums, the point of the fellowship isn't to actually prepare for the research forum. It's for us to sort of hear about the things that sort of um, were remarkable about your trip. So it's it's really helpful to hear the things that you, you think are important. Um, let me see what I can find for um, our chats. There are a couple of questions did pop up. Um, the first one is um, somebody is curious if the Mead spots would need um, discography of country music sources um, from the SFC had been helpful to, in particular, the Casey Jones research or, or I guess actually in your research as well, Noah. It's a, in a, I've not seen this one in the chat. What, what was the... I think it was to to Marie directly. Um, so that's it's oh, uh, okay. It's characterized. It's it's not a work that I'm familiar with. I don't work as intensively with the SFC, but it's a discography um, that helps trace the genealogy of ballads and traditional songs, and it, uh, it's described as being the Mead Spotswood Mead bibliography or discography. Um, it may be something that we can actually talk about making available to you at least specific sections, if, if that would be, you know, of interest to, to either of you. Um, yeah, I did not consult that, uh, but that would be uh, interesting, obviously, to, to get a hold of and look at if it does trace the, the okay. ballad. We'll look into that. That's, that's one of the things that often comes out of these research forums, too, is the idea that there might be more sources that, that are available. I, I mean, for instance, one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about the process of of looking for the origins of, of these sorts of songs um, and sort of reaching out to people was Guy Johnson's papers. He did a very similar thing um, with regard to the, the John Henry song. And I think the, the commonalities and the differences in your work might be really instructive. Um, um, I did look at the Gus Mead uh, collection at Aaron Smithers urging, uh, which I see Aaron's here and you know, I really appreciated his guidance uh, through this research process. Uh, the discographies were thorough. They were not really for me uh, because I was looking at, you know, more sort of old time than country music and more stuff that was sort of uh, circulating on the local level. But there were a ton of really interesting narratives uh, that he was a bit, they weren't all things that he had personally collected, but he had absorbed lots of other collections, it seemed. And lots of musicians whose music I've never even heard, they were just completely wild stories told that you know added a lot of context and color to uh some of the other materials so they were useful to me but that wasn't one where i actually found recordings i was looking for or anything it was it was a very good sort of contextualizer i wonder Noah. i'm thinking about an earlier comment that scott had about the way that actually engaging with the materials in the archives changed his project, um, sort of altered the focus of, of what he thinks he's going to ultimately write on. Did you have a similar sort of um, trajectory or did, did your work or how you were conceiving of it not really change sort of under the impact of the archival record? Um, I think, I don't think it changed like significantly. I mean, it's very, Unfortunately, I found, I did find, yeah, seven new songs or versions, which were totally new to me. Lots of variants I'd heard on things before, but there was very little discussion about this song. 
like it's not actually in pe many repertoires and uh yeah no one really asked well what what the hell do you think that means or whatever mm. uh so i don't think it changed the direction it just added a lot of detail that uh you know when you're lit, like maybe yeah like i say there's lots of variations on things that are already out there so when you've listened to one version and then you hear 20 versions by that same person with a little sort of commentary around it, then it starts to take on more of a life of its own. But the overall direction, I don't think changed so much. So I just like to stress again that I'm reading these questions. Um, so this is from a colleague. When I was 11, my parents gave me a folklore book that included a version of the Casey Jones song. In this version, there's discussion of Casey's sexual appetite and his visit to a brothel. It was rather shocking to my 11 year old self. Just wondering whether you'd come across versions discussing um, Casey's sexual appetite. And if you have any theories, um, Scott, about how these versions developed. Yeah, uh, I, I did. I think it's the Wilgus collection had a, a couple together. Uh, and without going into details, they are very explicit and, and, and not <laughs> suitable to share in this, 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 this audience here. Uh, I think it was college fraternities, I think is what they sort of attributed it to. I have to go back and look at the, the sources and this will be in the, the book at some point, I think, you know, heavily censored, obviously, but I think it was college fraternities decided, got a hold of the song and just made it very, very vulgar is my theory. This is um, a question from a colleague who's intensively involved in sort of um, creating audiovisual materials that are available to researchers. And they're wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you found, reviewed, and used AV materials in your research. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that the library digitized the stuff was the useful thing to me because I don't have time. I didn't have time to sit through eight tapes worth of Casey Jones songs and even make sense of it in an archive. But the fact that I could download it, have it on my computer, I can go back to it. That's what I think made it work. I think the fact that they can give us the stuff later to listen to. Um, yeah, I mean, there's basically two tracks. Like there's the already digitized stuff, which like once you run into the track listing and the field notes or wherever you find it, then this can be pretty quickly accessed. And then there's the undigitized stuff, which you know, it's a mystery <laughs> until it arrives. Uh, I mean, in many cases, I was interested in the stuff which wasn't yet digitized because uh, I could be wrong, but I reckon the library probably uh, prioritizes, you know, performers who have a lot of interest in their work and then some of the more marginal figures. I mean, some of the ones I found were like school projects, uh, some of these recordings or, you know, just a little fragment of a sort of verse and a half or whatever in some family setting. So uh, it's tricky, but uh, the staff was really helpful. And I think the pandemic was helpful too because they were all catering to just like one person at a time. <laughs> so they were, there were no complaints about ripping or delivering digitized copies. Uh, and for me, this was quite a luxury. Um. So Noah, this one is actually going to be in chat and you could read it too. This yeah. is, um, this is uh, Griel Marcus's work on Bascom Lamar Lunsford. I wish it had a mole in the ground. Yeah, I read this. This is actually one of the things that I was referring to when I was saying that, uh, that it's nonsense really, that it's surrealist or uh, he uses the word surrealist. And I think if you have an understanding, my contention and by the way, I don't claim that any of the performers or artists uh, who I'm studying think of the song the way I do necessarily. I don't make that claim, but um, my contention is that if you have an understanding of local folklore, history, uh, you know, vernacular speech and song, that it's all quite comprehensible, that none of this is really surrealist or that weird. Um, even, you know, the verses about I don't like a railroad road man. He'll kill you when he can and drink up your blood like wine. I mean, this is all sort of encroaching industrialization and, and uh, the threat that that spells to the mountain people at that time. Uh, so yes, I'm aware of Grail Marcus and 
I think he sounds like he doesn't hadn't probably really spent much time in, in these places. <laughs> although, although I did learn, for instance, about this thing about the colonial currency from his essay. So uh, it's, there's some valuable work there for sure. One of my colleagues is wondering about a particular source and whether or not it had proved valuable to you, um, liner notes that are associated with um, records and this. I've, re I've already read all the liner notes because <laughs> I have all the records that are relevant and uh, I don't need to go to the library for that. You know, when I go to the archive, I'm looking for something yeah, beyond sort of scope of what was commercially available even 70 years ago or whatever. Uh, but, but, but liner notes are an, an invaluable source of information generally. There's a lot of material that ends up in liner notes, which uh, doesn't quite make it into books or is meant to be read you know, in close proximity to the recordings. And uh, I love liner notes, but, uh, but I'd already read all the relevant ones when I came to the library. Scott, did they have any implications for your work? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I found some uh, in particular, I mean, some again was not in the, the library, but Robert uh, W. Gordon's notes on, I forget the exact collection in the twenties, uh, bring up the Charlie, Snyder kind of idea that there are these sort of variants out there and that was useful. I also was looking at letters uh, between Archie Green and some others and Mike Seeger in particular about a couple different collections they put together in the 60s of songs like Tipple Loom and Rail is one of them. And, and the correspondence is interesting. How'd they pick which songs go into this new canon? Uh, at one point they're trying to get a Casey Jones parody in one of these collections, but they couldn't because it was still copyrighted. There was a big fight, you know, between them and people organizing this. Can we actually even do this? Which again, is kind of interesting. How can, you know, somebody own an IWW labor parody, which is something that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll write about as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think in that kind of way, I, that, that is sort of uh, something I'm looking at, yeah, the line of notes. Um, so we have time, I think, let's try to squeeze in two more quick questions. The first one um, is um, Scott. Could you comment on Archie Green's statement that the railroad is the most important image in American folk music? Uh, yeah, I would 100% agree. I'm slightly biased because I'm, if you couldn't tell, a little obsessed with, with train songs. I have a, I think, 700 song Spotify playlist of songs about trains. Uh, so I would 100% agree. And I guess for me, Casey Jones' book product is a way to get at that bigger question of, of why there's so many songs about trains and at some point, I think the book will circle back to that. Uh, but I, I agree hundred percent. I just got a note, um, my screen sort of being blocked that um, maybe William Sturkey, um, William, was your, was your hand up? Um, if so, if you wanna unmute, I think you could, could ask a question. Yeah, hey, thank you. Um, so I have a question for Scott. Um, thank you both for the talk. Really appreciate it. It's great. Really enjoyed it. Um, so Scott, like I see that, uh, well, first of all, I want to share, I first encountered Casey Jones because he was helping the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the 1980s, you know, fighting Shredder and whatnot. But my question is, you know, there's so many, um, there's so many of these, you know, famous fi fictional or sorry, real life characters who become sort of bigger than life and they're used in very particular ways like Laura Ingalls Wilder and the West and, you know, frontierism and rugged individualism and like John Dillinger sticking to the man in the Great Depression. And there's such a diversity of ways that you've outlined that Casey Jones is used. I wonder, like, are you able to start thinking about, you know, what are the ways that, you know, like, what are the main themes that sort of connect all the different uses of Casey Jones throughout, be it in Ninja Turtles or folk songs, like what are the main, you know, what are the primary reasons that Casey Jones is used in all these different mediums? What's the connective tissue? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that, again, as I write this book, it's some, some, I, what are the central threads of the book? And I think, you know, labor and time, I think I have to circle back to the big themes. I mean, at the end of it, this is a guy who died on the job. Uh, he was trying to make up time going way too fast and it's not actually even you know reckless bravado it's the corporate schedule you know and and that's i think kind of an american story and one that i think uh aligns with the iww take on this of course that it's showing up on the lines of of labor struggles you know i mentioned gastonia i mean that was a strike about a stretch out too it's about time and the end of it uh 
and you know, there's even a, a modern, there's that trail, a train wreck in Lac Megantic, uh, Quebec, where a train went into the town and blew up the entire town. And someone wrote a Casey Jones version of that even. So, so I think there's this sort of theme of, of working and, and being bound to the clock that I think kind of unites all this. And uh, maybe it's not fully developed in all these sort of iterations, but that's, I think, what the book will largely sort of be themed around. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're actually a little past, past one, so I think I'll have to call time. I, I wanna thank you both for being here. And I also um, I was really happy to be able to introduce you to each other. Um, mm. I paired you because I thought that your work could in some ways talk to each other. And mm. as I said, in our sort of pre-discussion for this, I really regret the I really regret that the pandemic kept us from sort of allowing you guys to, to meet and talk and, and be a part of our community of scholars. Well, thank you all. Um, we have another um, upcoming um, research forum next month. Um, be lovely if you could attend. Um, take care so much. It's, it's been really nice to see you. Bye guys. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Take care everybody.